And right now we're going to see a practical example with our company. She's called Stactical. She's a decentralized service level management platform. Uh, are you guys familiar with service level management and SLAs? More than the other SLA. So just as a quick introduction, the SLA is basically a business agreement that will define a baseline level of quality you can expect from your providers and also ways to settle disputes whenever something bad happens, like a downtime. So we are going to see how Stactical is changing service level agreements and service level management practices using the blockchain and decentralization. So we met each other already, so we need to spend time on that. So the downtime is uh, what we are going to talk about. It's basically a time during which an online service is unavailable, so it's down. Uh, by opposition, we talk about uptime and uptime guarantee uh, to uh, designate what customers are expecting, meaning a service that is always working. And downtimes are pretty familiar, uh, relatable problems. We experience them at home, uh, at the office, while playing video games, but also while using producti productivity tools. So it's really something that um, is, I'd say, as old as the internet itself. And that comes with the fact that more and more we are using cloud softwares instead of softwares installed on, on our computers. So downtime is really a concern that moved from IT to pretty much everybody. And that's kind of the problem. Uh, customers and providers have misaligned expectations. As a user, you want your online service to work all the time. You know, if there's a downtime, you're angry, you get to Twitter, renting, uh, complaining, overflowing uh, support uh, teams, and help desk. So all in all, you're not very happy and you're really frustrated about downtimes. But at the same time, for providers, 100% uh, availability is not a sustainable objective. It's really hard to achieve, near impossible, actually, and it's extremely costly. So that's why most service level uh, uh, service providers are targeting things like 99.9% uh, uptime, which is something that you might have seen on hosting platforms or any kind of tools online, really. It's because 100% is way too expensive to achieve. So the solution and all, really, all these DevOps things are about pretty much closing the gap between customer expectations and actual operation and infrastructure requirements. You want to close the gap between customers and DevOps and developers and op operation uh, teams. And to close this gap, we are using three things. First, site reliability engineering, which is kind of an evolution of DevOps. It's a combination of tools and practices that maintain the availability of services. We are using help desk and customer support because you need to be there for the customer when the platform is down. And we are using business agreements and service level agreements. Business agreements could be things like um, IT outsourcing contracts, for example. If you're working with an offshoring development team, uh, this team can use a service level agreement to ensure that the work will be done in a, a certain uh, conditions, for example. And these are really the three things that you, we are using right now to close the gap between uh, customers and providers. Um, SRE, uh, which is pretty much something happening with the impulse of the centralized corporation that we were talking about earlier, and especially Google and Amazon, is really a combination of, of practices and of tools. Uh, as a site reliability engineer, you want to improve uh, what they call the mean time between failures. So you want to space uh, failures because the service that doesn't fail often is a, a service that is available often, pretty much. 
You want also to improve the mean time to repair, meaning that if a service goes down, you want to make it back up as soon as possible. So that's what NTTR as a metric uh, is representing. You want to make sure that you are always challenging and questioning your application design and making sure that you are doing technology watch by, for example, reading DevOps links and making sure that you know the latest and the greatest uh, regarding scalability, things like the uh, TAU, uh, for example, blockchain. This is kind of the, the things that you want to monitor on the market in order to make design choices. And you want to obviously leverage like unlimited computing resources. He seems happy about that. Like cloud computing, what they call edge computing, which is computing across uh, other devices than computers. Things like the Internet of Things, for example. How about, I don't know, running a media server at your home uh, using your washing machine connected to uh, your friend's uh, I don't know, refrigerator, for example. This will be possible using uh, edge computing. And you could also use technologies like auto-scaling and uh, serverless uh, technologies. Auto-scaling is the fact that um, you need uh, a growing or shrinking capacity for your servers in order to adapt to the number of people that are trying to use your service, basically. So AWS, for example, lets you configure stuff called uh, auto-scaling auto groups that will grow and, sh and shrink uh, according to the level of uh, usage you're getting on your service. Things like how many users per second are using my API, how many people are watching my homepage right now. These are the, some of the challenges addressed by auto-scaling. Then customer support, uh, uh, as I told you, uh, airless, you have things like incident ticketing, uh, incident uh, status pages, uh, call centers, because people, you would be surprised, people still like to call their provider when something is down. So you, have, you need to have a team that is able to receive this call, and this you know, drives a lot of expense and expenditures uh, for companies as well. And you have social media management because obviously, as I told you, people will rent on Twitter and you need a good community manager to calm things down and make sure that uh, people are hurt and, and reassure them that uh, everything's going to be okay. This is just a software, nothing happened. And then you have uh, service level agreements. Uh, as I told you as an introduction, uh, they define how reliable a service should be and they define ways to settle disputes when agreed service levels are not met. Which is really important because if there's a downtime, if you're a company, you're losing money. If you're a, a user at home, you're losing time, you're losing uh, entertainment opportunities. Uh, if you're an employee working using, for example, Slack or Asana or Trello or Jira or any kind of tool you are using in your daily work, you can't work anymore. And this has a cost, and this cost needs, needs to be somehow covered by something. And this something is the service level agreement, the business agreement that will compensate you in case something bad happens. So there seems to, to have quite a lot of things in order to address uh, uh, downtimes and service levels and stuff like that. So why is downtime still incredibly uh, challenging? What happened when, I don't know, modern customers and modern providers uh, discuss about the reliability of their system? How can we make them agree on the reliability they should expect from their system? And how can we make the downtime experience more bearable? Well, we're practical. <laughs> the Sactical helps companies provision and deploy decentralized SLA. So basically SLA, but on the blockchain. And these SLA are special because they are blockchain based. They are able to reward employees for uptime, but also compensate customers for downtimes. So on one hand, you reward employees SRE and DevOps and support employees for uptime, and the other end, you compensate 
customer for downtimes. You, you're paying the devils for that time, so you yeah. to reward them again. That's yeah. a good question, actually. <laughs> uh, you're paying the devils for that, but you still need to create the right amount of incentives and the right baseline in order for the devops to know what kind of metric he should meet, for example, when he ships a new software. What happens today is that many devops are not, or SRE, are not using what they call service level objectives. These are the objectives that, that you need to meet in order to make sure that your software is reliable and is meeting what is described in the service level agreements. So, as DevOps, you are paid, but you can be now rewarded for meeting specific service level objective that Stactical will let you uh, generate as well. So think of it as a positive way to drive the reliability of, of services using specific quantified objectives. Things like, uh, I shouldn't be able to deploy uh, my application in production if I am not able to handle one million users per second. If you make a modification in the system and you only reach 700,000, for example, you don't meet your SLO and you don't get the reward. But if you meet uh, this objective, you get the reward and you make sure that what you ship to production is actually meeting the expectation that you set uh, for your customers using the service level agreements because the customer with Tactical he knows that he can expect 1 million users per second uh, on this specific uh, platform. So it ties all things together ultimately and it creates a circular economy around uptime and uptime. But we're going to talk about that in two slides. Exactly. So decentralized service level agreement, decentralized service level agreement, so DSLA for token name. Uh, the tactical platform is powered by the DSLA token, which is really a token that is designed to fuel the tactical platform and to create these economic incentives at the right time for either improving system or compensating users when system fails. And here's how it works in the system. So we can start right there. So as I told you, um, the provider will start by defining service level objectives. These are the objectives that the DevOps team and the support team are supposed to follow, okay? Once you have your service level objectives set, the idea <coughs> is to form a compensation pool by staking the SLO. The idea behind staking is just to escrow uh, a certain amount of money for that money to be used in the system to do something specific. In our case, it's either rewarding uh, employees or compensating users. So as an employee, you define your service level objectives, you stake the SLA token and you form a compensation <coughs> pool. Yes. How do you define the number of or DCLA or coin that you have to form on your compensation pool? Is it a, based on the number of employees, number of clients? How it? Yeah, it's, it's based on all that. It's based on the size, the number of people you are willing to accept in your compensation program and the number of people you are willing to uh, reward uh, in your team. So this is something that as a provider you will be able to uh, define and describe uh, in a form that will help you generate the service level agreement and the compensation pool. Because this compensation pool is attached by the service level agreement that is deployed on the blockchain. And what happens when the service level agreement and the compensation pool are on the blockchain? We monitor services and depending on what happens or not on services, we either reward support team if nothing happens and if teams are able to maintain good service levels or we enforce service level agreements and we compensate users when there's a downtime where there, when there's any kind of service level violations happening. 
Service level violations can be downtimes, obviously, but also things like um, like a support team telling you that they will answer under 38 hours, but 72 hours later you did not get any kind of answer. So it's, so it's, it's not only technical uh, support, it's all no functional support. Yeah. It's support in the company, whatever support means and customer support means for your company, basically. And you can see that as a user, when you get compensated in DSLA token, you will have the uh, ability to withdraw them to your uh, wallet and to sell them on exchanges, yes? Yes, Crow is established by um, the company. Yes. Uh, oh, is it a tool that is uh, um, constituted between both the service provider and the, the company? That's a good question. Because, because if you pay both for uh, compensation mm -hmm. and reward, you, you are losing money, uh, losing money yeah. either way. Yeah. But it, that should be a, a way. But you are investing money, but yeah. yes. Yes, uh, indeed. But the, the um, service provider who is doing the SRE should put money in the escrow for yeah. them to lose money if they mm -hmm. don't. That, that, that's, that's a good question. Um, the main use case is provider for the compensation pool, but indeed uh, we will be able to stake DSLA as users uh, as well in order to grow uh, the compensation pool differently. And you will be able to team up with different companies in order to have an even bigger uh, compensation pool and structure relationship across different kind of stakeholders. Because if you look at a service today, uh, it's not a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, the service is using different other uh, technology partners and services that could also benefit from the system. So the idea is to onboard everybody so that the compensation pool is big enough in order to cover all kind of performance events, good and bad, and this definitely involves users and other partners than just the provider regarding the compensation. But this is something that we will have obviously to you know, fine tune uh, uh, and, and really measure the market response and, and what happens during our pilot program, which is starting uh, in January uh, 2019. There will be obviously some slight changes in the way the circular economy works. But the important part is really to have a, a basis for aligning the interest of users on one hand and providing on the other. This cabinet is basically a, a smart contract. This, it's, it's, it's a combination, it's a collection of smart contracts, each responsible for one specific thing. Yeah. Okay, you would need several smart contracts to operate this? Yeah. yeah. And most uh, a modern complex platform will use several smart contracts. Just like today in DevOps, you are using several services called microservices in order for your entire user experience to work. So, for in order to empower the platform, we are using many different smart contracts. We are using front-end clients as well because if you go to stacticon.com today you already have the ability to define your service level objectives using our technology, which is a predictive technology. And uh, we also have a, a backend, an API platform that you can uh, communicate directly with in order to trigger uh, the creation of your service level objectives. Regarding those transactions, uh, where is basically uh, in the intervene, what would you set your smart contracts regarding the cycles that you can, uh, you can perceive? Um, How many there, there are a lot of smart contracts over there. Outage. Okay. You need a contract to, and oracles actually, to uh, detect outages. Uh, is my service down or what? There will be a piece of code responsible for that logic. And you need also a smart contract to have all the description of the compensation pool, all the description of the service level agreements, and in order to trigger the compensation as well. But you, you can do everything in one smart contract if you want, 
it's just that it's not a scalable way to, to program because yeah. I would be specific. Like well, if you the, have one, of the, one of the key advantages in uh, using separated smart contract to do this kind of stuff like is, is that if you, if you think about what JD said about upgradable smart contracts, if you separate your concerts, if there's something responsible for monitoring, for example, you want to upgrade it, you won't have to trash your entire smart contract. You will be able to just replace the specific smart contract responsible for monitoring. And this is a more scalable approach that is really mimicking the learnings of the devil's world in terms of uh, uh, microservices and how we separate concerts and improve the maintainability of, of services by, by separating concerts like that. So apart from um, withdrawing uh, DSLA token to your wallet and go trading to your stuff, you can also choose to exchange your DSLA token for service collectibles or uh, service time on the Stactical Marketplace that we are developing right now. The gamers will call that loot or getting loot boxes in exchange for DSLA. That's kind of the idea. We want to give users a way to exchange their DSLA for further access to the service. So, if your, for example, Spotify is down for a day and you are not able to use Spotify for, for this day, you would get DSLA token that you could exchange for one month, for example, of free Spotify. And then you would be able to spend this service time, collectible, on the Spotify platform in order to access your one month free as a compensation. And you can see that Whenever you spend something in the tactical market, the DSLA token that you use, they go back to the compensation pool and they become ready to handle the next uh, failure. And that's why it's a circular economy, because it relies on recycling principle, just like circular economy in farms, for example, involve. Just that in that case, we are recycling DSLA, so lost time and productivity, into additional service time and service collectively. Unless the, the user withdraw the, the DSLA token. Yeah. But of what course. happens if, uh, if all the tokens uh, that? What happens if there is no more tokens? You, you, the compensation pool, remember what I said about auto scaling? The compensation pool will be auto scaling. So if it needs additional tokens, you will have the opportunity to fuel it with more tokens. Okay. The important thing to understand is that when you build such a system, what happens is that you get happier uh, customers, and happier customers stay longer. So there's a higher customer retention rate for your system and as a business you're making more profit because you have been able to show demonstrable care to your customer. And this is really what blockchain is about, aligning interests by showing demonstrable care in, in that case but by using economic incentives and this is what we're doing with the tactical platform. Yes? Regarding the, the rewards, um, would, would, it, would it still be in a circular uh, system? Uh, yes, in the sense that your, your provider... That, that's a good question. Actually, that's, that's a double, double circular economy. Right. So yeah. that would keep the DSLA to obtain what ultimately? Because at, at that point we can understand that the user could withdraw and get Bitcoins or whatever. But the idea is to entice them to stay, to keep the token in the system. I mean, for the, the provider, the provider was the, because once you have a reward, you want to get paid, or can they use it for something regarding the company, regarding Statical, or whatever? You can, that's a good question. You can use the DSL token on Statical for several different things, uh, access different plans, for example, unlock specific features, things like scalability prediction uh, on the Statical platform. As a provider, you will be able to exchange your DSLA for several features on the tactical platform but also to use what you got what you got as a reward in order to form new compensation pool or to strengthen existing compensation pool 
For example, as a provider, if you have, I want to launch uh, a public experiment uh, for a proof of concept, something like that, I could use uh, uh, my rewards as a way to form a new small compensation pool with my beta users and try to measure their reaction in that system with this kind of customer support uh, in, class, in place. You see what I mean? So, really as a provider, you will be able, because a provider, an employee, a support team member is a user too, as well. So you'll be able to uh, withdraw uh, a wallet, uh, withdraw GSLA to his wallet, or spend on the marketplace. Uh, as Regarding well. the withdrawal, well, who will establish the right? What do you mean? The token. Mm -hmm. The idea of with, with the rates, the rates of the token between the token and whatever um, cryptocurrency you the e Ethereum in that case. Uh, well, this will. Who, who this, is, this is what this is what an ICO is about. When you accept right. Ethereum right. in exchange for DSLA, you basically give DSLA the value of the number of Ethereum you accept. Right. So that's the initial rate of the DSLA token. After that, the DSLA token will get listed on exchanges and people will start trading it and this is when the, the value will, will, uh, will change. Yes? Uh, when you say the more approach and events in this um, is the footage? Uh, yes. So how is it uh, verified? Is it automatically verified? Mm -hmm. it automatically, uh, it's automatically verified and the perfect transition to that slide. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Just, just one question before I go to Yeah. Um, Let me get back. This it's too so exciting. Is it in this um, circular economy? Mm -hmm. We cannot consider that the compensation pool is a central part of the council. We are talking about the decentralized point, um, but we don't think, why we don't consider this is a central point, so the system is centralized on this with the compensation pool. Mm, no, the compensation pool is just an escrow, it's not centralized. It's free on the blockchain, and everything that is on the blockchain is decentralized. I said that because there is no um, uh, direct uh, link between, for example, yeah, between the provider and user, so both of them they have to, uh, to, to connect with the compensation pool to, to they, There is direct link uh, between the two, okay. but it's a product uh, kind of thing, meaning that the, the user experience that we build on Stactical.com will bring uh, provider and users together for many different things. Things like you as a user, your ability before signing up to a, a provider, your ability to check the decentralized service level agreement and see that this provider is giving you uptime guarantees, for example. Mm -hmm. This is something that involves the user that wasn't involving the user before. Mm -hmm. See what I mean? So in, in that sense, it benefits from the transparency and all the properties uh, of the blockchain. And these properties, we like internally to uh, use a pun. Uh, we say that uh, they are uh, fiat properties, uh, actually. Uh, because there is fairness, inclusiveness, uh, accountability, trust, and transparency as benefits you can generally get from the blockchain. And from there, when you get this framework of fiat, you are able to see for your platform, your very service, what the blockchain can bring to the table. So in our case, fairness, decentralized SLA are more fair because you don't need to claim compensation. Everything happens automatically. As a user, you get instantly compensated whenever a service goes down based on the terms of the uh, SLA. So in that sense, the uh, SLA is even driven and it doesn't require manual submission of proofs, basically. Because you have to know that most of the time, if you want to get compensated for the downtime of a service, you need to be the one to collect the proofs and to submit the proofs to your provider. So decentralized SLA is a better system to, to make that. Inclusiveness because SLA were typically uh, reserved to, uh, to business people, to professionals. 
And this is the opportunity to give anybody access to uh, SLA. Imagine being compensated for the downtime of uh, Facebook, for example. Knowing that Facebook is monetizing your personal information so that there's money behind the fact that you use or don't use Facebook, wouldn't it be fair if you were compensated for Facebook, Facebook going down, for example? Would you, yes? Well, uptime guarantee is the strong competitive advantage. Okay. As a user, if you're looking, for example, for cloud hosting, uh, you will look for the most reliable cloud hosting among other different characteristics. And this system is something that will help you confirm the reliability uh, of a provider and make a purchasing decision based on that displayed reliability. That's one example. But the biggest uh, um, benefit for a provider of using this system is that since it's self-executed, automated, it is hyper-efficient. You receive less tickets to the um, customer support, to the help desk, because users are compensated automatically. Before that, they used to submit compensation claims to your customer uh, support team. So there's a good chunk of the ticking that generally happens during downtimes that you wouldn't get uh, with that system. Beyond that, uh, customer retention will be increased because by providing uh, compensation, it is measured that customers tend to stay longer uh, with the service and generate a higher lifetime value. So this is more profit uh, as well for the, uh, for the provider. And also, you don't need to run through uh, legal uh, intermediaries when you're using that system. If there's a dispute regarding a downtime, there's a lot of legal paperwork involved, a lot of legal fees, and this dispute can go so far that it drives two teams into legal dispute for days, weeks, or maybe more. This is a system that will ultimately settle disputes automatically without involving uh, lawyers. So at the end of the day, it's a lot of economy uh, uh, and savings. Uh, it's more accurate to say savings in English, I guess, uh, for, the, for the providers. And it's not just about creating value. Indeed, you're right for consumers. It's about creating value for everybody and aligning the interests of everybody. This is what the blockchain game is really about. And for the providers as well, accountability is important because when a service goes down, because you are using a third party technology that is down. For example, let's say your e-commerce platform and your payment technology is down and your partner uh, uh, is not able to restore service of his payment technology, you are the one that uh, people are sh shouting at on Twitter, actually. Because they believe that you are the one responsible for this downtime. So, being able to transparently prove who is responsible for what downtime when the downtime happens is a great way to alleviate the frustration uh, associated with downtime. Because you know exactly who is responsible for and the trust that you are putting and the faith you are putting in your provider is really differently uh, affected if you know that he's not responsible for that failure. If you know that there's something happening in the street, like someone cuts a cable or, or, or whatever happened, or my payment provider is responsible for the time or whatever. So accountability is, and this is due to the fact that everything is recorded and you can delete anything on, on the blockchain. If you are able to record on the blockchain that a service is the combination of free services, for example, and service number three is down, you cannot blame service number one uh, anymore. And this is really important in the way we are going to structure the relationship between uh, customers and their providers. In terms of trust, 
Um, you have to understand that today, providers are the one monitoring their services. They are the one telling you it's down or, or, or not. So if you go uh, to see a provider uh, and because you've experienced downtimes, the provider is perfectly able to tell you that it's not true. It happens all the time when we still this. Yeah, it happens all the time. And it happened recently on a pretty ma massive incident with AWS. Mm -hmm. uh, because AWS told uh, their customers that, okay, I'm not responsible for these things. Uh, this is another SLE that is managing this part of the business. Uh, move. No compensation for you. So there's definitely a trust issue regarding monitoring, and what we want to do is enable non-partisan monitoring to happen, meaning that people that have no interest in gaming the system become the watcher of the availability uh, of, of platforms online and are the one telling you that something is down uh, or not. It's a much better option and a much better way to mitigate the trust issue uh, regarding uh, service level agreement and availability in general. And last but not least, uh, transparency. Remember, this was all about aligning the expectations of providers and customers. It becomes with transparency. The system is a way to share the technical details of the reliability of your system. As a consumer, if I'm able to see what's behind the scene in, in simple words that everybody can understand, I can set my expectation accordingly. You know, I can set and align my expectation with the real characteristics of the service. That's very important. So do not expect the service to be online 100% of the time if your provider is telling you that he's working with 99.9 .9 objectives uh, uh, as a target. Because 99.9 .9 is actually uh, a couple days of downtime for a provider. And a provider needs these couple days in order to roll out features, in order to do uh, infrastructure maintenance, uh, in order to basically also have room for errors. 70% of the time, a service goes down because of a developer error, configuration issue, most likely. Yes? Um, what type of uh, services actually can use the SLA today? Like can a traditional service that is not based on blockchain yep. use uh, Statical? Good question. Uh, any kind of service can use uh, Statical. And we are mostly today targeting uh, cloud software. So really all the services you know about, all the online games you know about, all the online banks you know about, all the services that basically have um, scalability issues because they need to serve many people, or they need to do many transactions with a lot of value behind those transactions. This is the case for online banks, for example. All these services, uh, these are the companies that we want to help uh, with Satical. And after that, obviously, uh, blockchain uh, services. But there are not that many as of today. So. I had a question, but thanks to her, I know uh, now I know the question that I wanted to ask. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say I want to use your service. Mm -hmm. Let's say I want to uh, uh, be fair with my customer. Mm -hmm. uh, I, but my service uh, use another service, third mm -hmm. party service like GCP. Mm -hmm. uh, should I like can I like, go by myself with Statical, or should I like talk with? GCP and say, okay, let's use Statical for... Uh, when, when you say use your service, you mean because as, as a provider or my, as a consumer? If my service goes down because one of a region, like say the Belgian region goes down, mm -hmm. like one of, of one of the EAT, uh, it's not my, it's not my like, fault. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's GCP fault because it has a network issue yep. or something. Yeah. And should well, I in, in a perfect world, Statical has should all the companies exactly. in the world as customers so yeah. and is able to escalate uh, issues to the actual provider who is responsible. This is a target. 
He says, what you're talking about is the vision. You should come and work with us. <laughs> you know? this, is, this is really, the, this is the, re the, the vision behind Saxico, meaning that the more network partners you are able to onboard, uh, the stronger uh, the compensation schemes, uh, schemes uh, can become, and, and the better will be the experience for the end user. But that doesn't mean that even if it's GCP's uh, fault, as a, as a provider, you are not going to put uh, the investment in order to compensate your customers. Because at the end of the day, you want your customers to stay. And this is a good way to make them stay uh, and, and keep using your service. Uh, yep, good question for you. Because like, your business model works because we have a central entity that handles all the business logic. The more we move forward in the blockchain, the less central entity we're going to see on the yep. business. So there is nobody to blame because we are all responsible for the infrastructure. So how are you going to see yourself when like blockchain application is everywhere and there is nobody to blame and That's say, oh, this is because we are all responsible for the architecture as a node user. That, that, that's that's, that's, five, ten years where that's true. Is that, that's what a dreamer would say. That's that's again that's 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 again that's a good dream. Meaning, is uh, tactical still relevant in a full, uh, fully decentralized world without doubt? That's a good question. The thing is, we don't just only deal with downtimes. We deal with application failures in general, and each and every business will have its own definition of what kind of failure is impacting it. For example, it could be request per second uh, that needs to be at a certain baseline and even though the API isn't down, if you get uh, 2,000 transactions per second instead of the advertised 4,000, this is a service level violation and you will need to get compensated by that. And even in the, if the, in the blockchain world, varying throughput, this kind of situation and other kind of failures will happen. Blockchain is not a way to avoid 100% of failures. It's great for availability, but not uh, uh, all failures. Beyond that, you have to understand that also customer support will not disappear with the blockchain. So even if the service is never down, customer support needs to be never down. If you see what I mean. Because customer support is also a system with its own SLA and its own objective. F think about the 48 hours uh, to answer a ticket. D this is an SLA. And this will be an SLA in a fully decentralized world as well. So the ability to compensate the shortcomings of support teams is another use case for the tactical platform. It's not just about uh, the availability of systems in, in the sense of IT systems, it's also the availability of systems in the sense of human systems. But uh, we will talk a bit more about that because we have big plans uh, to address the scalability of human systems uh, in the future. So, yes? I have a question. So, where is the DevOps aspect? Where is the DevOps aspect? Yes. Where is uh, the, well, the, the connection, connection with DevOps? I, for me, I, I'm thinking that uh, where would this happen? Some DevOps processes uh, that it's, uh, it's automatic, automatically maybe well, the, the DevOps to, is to, to resolve the problem. Maybe it's better to recompose. Maybe if I'm if I'm uh, if I'm a customer of cloud service, mm -hmm. my problem is that my service uh, is the down. Not that I, I, I will not do business with my contacts. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, um, if you, these are two questions. Do you have uh, um, DevOps um, added value in, in this, um, in this uh, solution? The solution, I, I see it uh, full uh, financial. Financial, this? Service so level agreements? Yes, it's five, full financial. Yeah. Is a, this aesthetic uh, all, the ability to define your service level objectives is actually a combination of two things. First is uh, 
uh, a series of load tests that ramp up against your service. That's how uh, Stactical defines your service level objectives. And then the results of these load tests are analyzed using uh, predictive technologies and AI in order to automatically generate your service level objectives. So you can see Stactical as uh, an engine for defining SLO and deploying SLA. And if we want to be like 100% uh, accurate, service level agreements are part of the DevOps principle altogether. So this is a project that is DevOps by nature because it's a, a SLM, a service level management platform. It's fundamentally uh, DevOps, even though, and I understand your question, it is using uh, economic incentives uh, in order to drive DevOps actions uh, to the right direction. That, that, that is true, but the ability really to define your service level objective through load testing and scalability prediction, as well as generating your SLA, these are the kind of tools DevOps people build every week. And when we talk about site reliability engineering, it's because our main user of the Stactical platform is the SRE. It's the site reliability engineer that wants to create you know, incentive for itself, meet its, uh, his uh, reliability uh, objectives, and make sure that everything happens automatically in terms of compensation in, in the production environment. So if, if I understand, you, you provide near uh, yeah, technology that uh, uh, provide to define exactly their uh, yeah. essay. Yeah, uh, exactly. Uh, are you ready to refund uh, your customers to, if, if your ER program don't have to? You mean problem? ourselves, yes. dog fooding? Yes. That's that an work? excellent question. And yes. That work correctly? yes, that's the plan. That's the plan. I mean, uh, we even wanted at some point to have some kind of, you know, Netflix, they have a, um, what they call a, a, a chaos monkey, which is a, a, a guy that unplugs things in their system. And the, the, the Netflix engineers are trained for the system to keep working even though there's this, this crazy monkey like messing things up in the back end. Ideally, we would use something like that. Maybe planned downtime for Stactical in order just to demonstrate how the system works with us. But obviously, we cannot provide something like that and not you know, have our own company using it. So that's definitely the plan, yeah. And just to finish with uh, some numbers in order to size this here, to size the opportunity. Um, so that's, what I, that's why I was saying that Sactical is a true DevOps uh, product. It's part of uh, an industry called ITSM, or ITOSM, which is IT Service Management. And all DevOps tools are part of this industry, actually. The total addressable market for the ITSM market is 17.5 billion. So that's a significant uh, enough number to be considered. The specifically what we're talking about here, so the performance and customer management, so the SLO definition and the compensation is approximately nine billion dollars. Uh, and our objective is to secure just a small chunk of this available market and to have uh, 300 million uh, revenue within five to seven years. That is our business objective with the platform. For more information, you can go to stactical.com. You can play with the platform uh, and define your SLO and run scalability prediction. Uh, it's pretty straightforward, even though it's, it's a DevOps tool, so you, you, you need you know, a bit of understanding of what you're doing. But don't go try to take Google down or do things like that because you are going to get us into trouble. But sh surely have a look at uh, the tactical platform to see uh, you know, more information and how things work uh, more tangibly. And as I said to some of you uh, earlier today, the token sale uh, starts uh, soon. The pre-sale sort starts in uh, October the 1st, actually. If you want to discuss with the team, JDI, 
the rest of the team and the tactical community. You can find us on uh, Telegram, which is kind of the default social network for uh, crypto companies. And I think that's it. Merci.